I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, except that I thought I would be a priest. And um, eventually I wasn't a priest, so I didn't even go to the seminary. I took uh, my exams from the University of Ghana. I was uh, accepted into agricultural sciences. I actually didn't go for the lectures in the university. Um, I, I was just trying to discover myself. And unfortunately, the dean uh, picked up that I've not been attending the lectures and said, well, you're obviously not serious and we'll probably have to ask you to leave. He said, maybe you would like to go to try at the computer science department if you'd be interested. I took to it like fish to water. I enjoyed the mathematical background, the logics, and I thrived in it. I did very well. And after one year in Ghana, the universities were shut as a result of the revolution in Ghana. Um, and they were, they were not open for a long time. And my father suggested that I should transfer to the University of Lagos. So I ended up at the University of Lagos in computer sciences. Uh, and after my youth service, I got a job with um, a computer company. I was just happy in, in the company, but think about IT as a very high obsolescence product, and we take 85% from the customer, and we're not delivering the goods in three months, not in six months, not in eight months. Before we deliver the goods, they are already obsolete. And the customer is always phoning me to ask, so where are my goods? So I thought, I can do it better. Instead of burning my goodwill, let me go and um, uh, start. And when he told me that, I actually thought he had gone crazy. His father was alive. And the father thought the same thing. And we were all worried. And of course, my father thought, this guy is crazy. My wife was, it was, wasn't my wife then, my fiancé then. What do you want to do? You have a good job. In Nigeria, in Africa, you find a job, a stable job. Everybody believes that you should keep that job. You shouldn't take the plunge into the uncertain. If we were delivering to the customer just as we said, I probably would not have had any uh, inclination to even leave. But the fact that we couldn't keep our word, it was not something I could accept. You want him to be happy, that was the bottom line. And so he had all the support he could get. They, he, he couldn't do it without the support. He needed to know that he was coming back home to a stable environment. And that for me was one of the major things. You know, the sacrifice needed to be made. I must also say that I did have faith. I felt if you work hard and if you did it right and you believe in God, something will happen, something will give. And every year something happened. So in one year, it will be the presidential advisory committee that wanted to put a microfilming system. In another year, it will be the National Administration of Food and Drug that wants to put in a system. You know, there's always one big one that comes and keeps us, you know, going. And um, there was a big bombshell. Big bombshell. This happened in 1993. And when a coup happens, you're not too sure what life on the streets will be, whether there will be a protest. You know, it's the, the entire country is in a disarray. You don't know what the next policies are going to be. You hear noises like ka 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 ka, doom. <laughs> you know, and then you see some flashes. This is what a military coup looks like. But this is not a film. This is an actual life. If I go back to 93, it's a difficult time for you to think I want to do, go into business and start my own company. Uh, Mr. Okere was already in employment at the time. So it was an extremely brave decision uh, to leave that secure employment uh, and try to venture out on his own. Many companies died 
And the companies that will typically die is a company that is very leveraged. It takes a long time to really adjust to a major shock. And therefore, some businesses closed completely, packed up and, and left the country. So we were very lean in terms of our leverage, just what we needed for the business. So obviously, we were able to sustain for a longer period of time during this crisis period. It's an opening that was being left. And so that instead of running away, you better invest and then seize the opportunity. So that's what, uh, that's what they did. Really, uh, he was brave and the braveness has paid off. After normalcy was returned, the few companies that were there, like Computer Warehouse, had a lot to do. Because there's a pent-up demand. Many companies have uh, gone under, and things still have to be done. So this was a point where we accelerated in our growth, post uh, June 1993. In a situation where the rule of law is not that strong and you are not sure how justice will go, what you look for is trust. So we decided that we're going to brand our company and differentiate it based on trust and integrity. And someone will say, what kind of differentiation is that? But it was very, very appropriate in our environment. In the wider society, it is a, it is a, a bit of deficit of trust. And, um, and that deficit of trust creates problems for a lot of companies. As, as somebody said, the biggest cost to doing business in Nigeria is trust. Investors need to understand the terrain. They need to understand the Nigerian psyche. This is not an easy place to fly in, do a transaction, and fly out. The family system in Africa kind of um, uh, dictates how you interact with people. Friendship plays a lot of role in what we do. You know, we compete by service excellence, but we also compete by the relationship you have with the customer. We we'll get three engineers to be on site. That's exactly what I want to achieve as well. Initially, you know somebody, but you need to deliver to the person's expectation. You build the trust, and then, of course, you you, you get repeat uh, business. So, customer intimacy is very key. It's okay, sir. We can be there as early as ten o'clock. We can have more than one engineer to be on site. Um, the, the contract CWG has here would be a managed service contract, which means on-site. But the people here who are not on-site engineers will just come from CWG here on support basis, you know, okay. They just come here, fix what they need to go and go back. So, I mean, I think it depends on the agreement on, on those solutions. I, I do technology and infrastructure architecture. So basically planning, strategy, roadmap, um, design. It's uh, MTN is, I believe, the biggest um, telecoms company in West Africa, and maybe even Africa. Um, the Nigerian operations has almost 50 million subscribers right now, and for CWG to be supporting the infrastructure that supports, you know, the largest telecoms company in the West Africa would simply mean that it, it's a prestigious account. It will be about the biggest. Um, yeah, I, I think people will sh shoot for this account. Yes. We didn't in the beginning have a mind to go into three years. We were a hardware company, we were Dell. That's what we were doing. Because of the customer intimacy, service excellence, they ask us, can you network our Dell systems for us? There's so many difficulty when you are learning something new. But once you have learned something new once, you can always learn something new many times. So with the ATM now, you don't even need a physical agent. So carry out all those agent functionalities. From the ATM, you'll be able to do caching. So the ATM machine that is serving as an agent also has um, an inbuilt um, fake currency detector. So once you put in, you want to do a caching, once you put in a fake money. And then the customer says, well, but you know, we're doing online banking. 
With all my cash gone on shopping, I was already in panic mode when I called my husband. Don't worry, he said. I'm transferring money to your account right now. So now we have to connect not only local area networks, but wide area networks. Thank you for banking with us. So we invest and then we're able to do the networking. This is where we monitor the entire network. So here we have a, a big screen where we monitor all the back callings. So by back calling, what I mean is we, we provide connectivity for our customers. So we have a, a kind of start topology. All the branches are linked to this place. This is a central location. Mm -hmm. And from here, we have a link to the head offices of our uh, customers. So most of our customers are banks. That is how we came to do hardware, communication, and software. But people say that this company is a jack of all trade. So we say, I said to myself, maybe the best thing to do is to break it up. So we have a, a different team running the hardware, a different team running the software, and a different team running their communication with their own salesmen and their own general manager but we have central HR, central marketing. They all have their different logos. If you scratch a bit, you know it's the same company. And that was the biggest challenge. How do we optimize the best of the three? For me, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't difficult because I could benchmark one against the other. Why are you spending more on diesel? This one is not spending more. Why are you not making this amount of turnover? This one is making... So we're able to grow them in unison. However, now we had those silos. Now they are big companies. Now they are different directions. Now they are not talking to each other. There was convergence in the industry. So Dell was making switches and Cisco was making computers. So with that convergence, there was a need to optimize the the three companies. So now we have one company with three divisions rather than have a holding company with three subsidiaries. When we didn't need money, I still had my mind on listing. At that time I used to tell our, our colleagues and our staff that one day we'll list on the Nasdaq, but let's start on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. The reason, the reason we wanted, I, I thought we should list, was, was simple. One, a listed company imbibes governance because you have to report, number one. Number two, people tend to trust a listed company more because it's more open. They can have access to the information. For a long time, we thought we didn't need money that much because uh, we were cash sufficient. But then opportunities then came to increase our profile. And then in 2009, we really wanted to raise money because now we were in a very high capitalized business that the telecommunication company has become. You need to put down hops, you need to buy segments, and you need time for it to scale. Unfortunately for Computer Warehouse, just at the time they were to go to the market, the bubble had burst and then the market collapsed completely. Uh, as we invested, we felt the company wasn't ready mm -hmm. for uh, uh, a listing at that moment in time. And uh, we kind of uh, challenged uh, the management mm -hmm. To, to tell them why we felt they were not ready. They listened to us after a uh, lot of discussion and really now the company is ready for the listing and it wasn't really ready in 2008. So this, the lesson we learned, very difficult lesson, you do something when you can, not necessarily when you want. Population of Lagos goes anywhere from 10 million to 30 million. <laughs> the better thing now, who you ask and where you come.
to start with, the infrastructure has not kept up with the growth. So since 1970s to now, very little infrastructure has gone in. Now, if you take time waste, opportunity cost of time, in the gridlock that we call go slow, well, we call it go slow, we call it traffic. We call it go slow because you're just creeping along. And there are many cars and not enough roads. So at the end of the day, if I take a day where I could make maybe four meetings or five, but I'm only able to make one or two, the cost is humongous. Uh, Nigerians uh, live through a lot of difficulties. And what I mean by that is uh, basic things, even things like power, is limited in Nigeria even today. We probably generate between four to 5,000 megawatts as a country. The problem has been very, very severe. There was a time we were getting electricity supply about three hours a day. You know, you switch on uh, 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 an electricity plug and you expect to have electricity. Not, not here in Nigeria, not yet. People are uh, uh, being pushed to have expensive sources of power. We all rely on generators. I'm, so, I'm sure you've seen as you, as you go around, practically the generators are on all the time. Now that's an expensive source of power, both in terms of cost and in terms of what we're doing to the environment. Okay. Here in Nigeria, we don't have uh, we have problem with power supply, generally. So we run more on generator, so thereby causing incurring more costs on diesel. We have the generator supply, and we have from the utility supply from the government. Okay, so those ones we are mostly have challenges because some of them they supply a low voltage. Okay, some of them the voltage will not be will not be okay for the system to perform. So we make sure that everything runs 24-7, 365 days. We spend money on infrastructure, basically UPS, fuel, generator, diesel. If you look outside, we don't have only one generator. We have more than three generators. We have not one, not two, three. We have three running here. We have the fourth one out there called emergency. Because it spent most of the money in the diesel. The challenges in Nigeria that I talked about are not excuses. We don't offer any excuses and we don't boot any. Because we knew about these challenges, it's not new to us. The question is, how do we turn these challenges to opportunities? And the best way to turn these challenges to opportunities is not to complain about them, but to work around them and to try and effect change whenever you can. Before I started this company, I'd read a book called The Magic of Thinking Big, and I was very impacted by the book. So I was very clear that we're not going to build something that is just going to put bread on the table. When people encounter him, they always want to know where he was educated, and it's always it's a proud thing to say that he's a totally African-educated man. And it then tells you that if Austin that was trained in Africa can achieve a company of $130 million turnover with 650 people that is in four countries. It gives hope to other people that says, then I can. I don't have to work in Goldman Sachs to be able to achieve that. He should be a role model for, for the Nigerian entrepreneurs and, and, and youth because he's not shy of learning. He's not shy of uh, asking uh, questions or pushing the boundaries. He's extremely ethical. Uh, and he cares about his people. He cares about his country. He cares about making a difference. What we thought we were building was a company of African roots that will be a beacon something that will signal that our time has come.